everyone, and welcome to our cardiovascular grand rounds from the DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. I'm Dr. William Zogby, Chief of Cardiology here at Methodist. And before introducing our special speaker today, there are a few uh, items that I'd like to share with you. One that we're broadcasting live as usual through live stream and YouTube. Um, the recordings will, as usual, be available for you at your leisure. Uh, the uh, uh, we welcome you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm happy to share with you that we're more than 97,000 viewers, and hopefully by the end of the summer, we will celebrate 100,000 viewers that uh, share our uh, educational format, be it in Grand Rounds or imaging or any other educational venue. I think that would be wonderful. Uh, you will see on your screens how you can send your uh, questions by either texting through the, to the Bakey or uh, uh, through the uh, internet if you're on, on the internet. I'd like to share also with you there are a couple of conferences that are coming uh, shortly. One is our uh, probably ninth or tenth annual uh, cardiovascular boot camp, August 18 to 20, where we bring uh, first year cardiology and uh, surgical fellows and anesthesia fellows to come and and train have a boot camp here with hands-on experience, multimodality imaging for the clinician. Our 12th annual this year will be in October, and you will see announcements regarding that. So on to our Grand Rounds today. This is really a very special Grand Rounds. Um, it will be given by Dr. Cindy Martin. Uh, Dr. Martin, our new recruit here to the DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center, uh, a stellar performance in academia and clinical medicine. Um, did her MD in Louisiana State University and our next state here, Louisiana, and it's great to have her back close to her home state. Uh, her stint in medicine went to UT Southwestern. This is where she trained actually in multiple areas. One certainly did her internal medicine cardiology fellowship, molecular cardiology fellowship, advanced heart failure fellowship, uh, really was stellar in uh, basic laboratories doing her basic work and uh, was recruited to University of Minnesota in 2007 where she spent basically 15 years of her academic life there. She is a triple threat and uh, the true, the nice triple threat is that her interest is not only in heart failure and the mechanisms of heart failure but also she's very interested and actually has built a program for adult congenital heart disease. And this is actually the link to her, uh, to her topic today and Grand Rounds, in addition to a cardiomyopathy, inherited cardiomyopathy clinic. So her interest is quite broad. Uh, she had a, a basic science laboratory where she uh, focused on stem cell research and I think has switch from the very, very basic to translational medicine where she built animal models to look at right ventricular remodeling and pulmonary hypertension, adult congenital heart disease, uh, has really been uh, amazingly productive, uh, contributed to an R01 at the University of Minnesota before she came. And uh, she's quite involved in all the societies, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, uh, the American Society of Transplantation, heart failure, you name it. And uh, she's an amazing contributor. She's been here only for less than a year and has made an impact uh, in our adult uh, advanced heart failure program, adult congenital heart disease, as well as inherited cardiomyopathies. Um, she is currently the uh, chief or head of our advanced heart failure program, transplantation and uh, mechanical support. And it's a pleasure having her address us today on advanced heart failure in the adult congenital heart disease population, a topic that is very dear to her heart. Dr. Martin. So I think yeah, I can kind of sum up what Dr. Sadagri said. I like to do a lot of training and I'm old. So, because I've been able to do all those things that we've kind of talked about, but it's really a great pleasure to talk to you today about um, heart failure in adult congenital heart disease. It's really a special topic in my heart, um, something that I spent a lot of years kind of looking at. And today, I really want to kind of give an overview of the current state, 
and really highlight a lot of areas of need and hopefully stimulate some discussions about some things that we can look at. So I have no relevant disclosures uh, for this uh, talk. But why am I talking to adult cardiologists about congenital heart disease? Well, first of all, we know that congenital heart disease occurs in about 1% of births, and you're like, great, I'm not a pediatric cardiologist. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you that congenital heart disease is growing by 50,000 patients per year, even in 2020s. And before the area of congenital heart disease surgery, a half a century ago, fewer than 30% of children actually lived into adulthood. And so this is why we kind of think of congenital heart disease as a pediatric disease. However, now more than 90% of patients with congenital heart disease um, survive into adulthood. And about 20 years ago, we flipped to where there are actually more patients that are adult with congenital heart disease than there are children. And in industrialized countries, the congenital heart disease population is two-thirds adults. So they're, gonna, they're coming. They're in your community. They're in your clinics. We have to embrace the fact that these patients exist. In the United States, just in the past decade, the number of adult congenital heart disease has gone from 1.4 million to 2.2 million patients in the United States. Here's a little scary thought. The average age of the adult congenital population now is 57 years old. So now not only do they have their congenital heart disease, but they're also going to be having some of their acquired normal um, heart failure problems that comes with an aging population. I think the thing that we have to be prepared for is one of the biggest growing populations is the complex congenital heart disease, particularly the hypoplastic left heart syndrome. We're gonna start seeing a wave of single ventricle patients and single ventricles that are right ventricles. They're now hitting their early 20s and mid-20s after the uh, improvements in surgical techniques. We do know that these patients often face continued cardiovascular issues and need for advanced uh, therapies. Just to put kind of the cost in perspective, it's estimated that the adult congenital uh, patient population's healthcare cost is $1.9 billion per year. Um, and I think a thing that really kind of has sparked interest in the heart failure um, part of this is hospitalizations for adult congenital patients with heart, uh, with congenital heart disease has increased more than 91% over the past decade. And that's compared to only 21% of non-adult congenital heart disease patients. So what we're seeing is we're seeing a large amount of patients that's coming. They may be sicker at baseline just because of their congenital heart disease, but they're also aging. And so we're seeing more of them. So we're supposed to be talking about heart disease, right? And we will, but I want to go over just a first little brief classification. And this is important just for you to keep in mind. And this is just stepping back a little bit for the adult, con uh, the congenital heart disease classifications are important to see. And um, the community has divided the uh, congenital heart disease into three different classifications. And we'll, I will show you mild, moderate, and, and complex. And even patients that are, quote, a mild uh, congenital heart disease really need to be seen by an adult congenital specialist at least once a year. And I'm really gonna take a minute to plug the importance of the adult congenital heart disease specialist um, because a lot of these patients honestly don't know what they had. I mean, how many patients come into your clinic and say, I was born with something, I had a hole in my heart and I had a surgery and they told me I was fine? Um, that may or may not be true. Um, and so what I would, um, kind of really stress is the guideline recommendations that even people who have mild, quote, congenital heart disease need to be seen by adult congenital cardiologists at least once so they can actually review um, their history, confirm that they have what they think that they have, and make sure that there's no other residual lesions or other things that we need to be looking out for. Patients with moderate congenital heart disease um, really need to be followed consistently by adult congenital heart disease specialists. Um, and that would really, uh, the recommendations if they're seen every other year. This can be shared with their uh, primary cardiologist or their primary care physician. But again, they need to be plugged in and stay in touch um, with the adult congenital specialist. And people with complex congenital heart disease need to be followed yearly and really their home lives with the adult congenital uh, clinic. Um, and it will be a lot of these complex uh, congenital heart disease patients that we're gonna be speaking about when we talk about heart failure. But how do we talk about heart failure? Well, first of all, we need to define heart failure, right? And that seems simple until you step into the world of adult congenital. So how do you truly decide when an adult congenital patient has heart failure? 
So there really is no true consensus definition of heart failure in an adult congenital population. And then we have to go back because unlike patients with acquired heart failure, adult congenital heart disease patients have never had a normal myocardium. Their heart has been abnormal since birth. Um, and there's really been no single inciting event like a big myocardial infarction, like the development of severe valvular disease that start into context these, this wave of neurohormonal changes, adverse remodeling, subsequent clinical deterioration. And so when in their, in their progress or, or when in their lifetime do you say you have heart failure? Well, in 2016, we got together and we wrote a consensus paper, and this is kind of one of those, you know, paper definitions that sound really nice, but I think it really does try to talk about what we uh, described as heart failure, is saying that heart failure in the adult congenital uh, population is a syndrome characterized either by pulmonary or systemic venous congestion or inadequate peripheral oxygen delivery at rest or during exercise caused by cardiac dysfunction. Okay, basically they have symptoms of cardiac limitation. But I think I would ask that you really think of heart failure in the congenital patient as a persistent syndrome. It's really, again, this continuum. And it kind of goes back to what we've talked about with the AHA of the stages, A, B, C, and D. Um, and, but I would say that the adult congenital heart disease patient is always a vulnerable patient when it comes to heart failure. And so we need to be thinking of them and trying to do risk factor modification really from even in, in childhood um, because the odds are we're gonna see heart failure develop, it, develop. So as a heart failure physician, we all love our objective testing. So what about CPET? Doesn't that, that should be able to tell us who has heart failure, right? We have a lot of data of acquired patients of saying we, we can give numbers of what their cardiac exercise performance look like. Um, and there was a study that reviewed over 6,500 adult congenital patients with CPETs, and not surprisingly, the mean VO2 was significantly less than their age-matched controls, and that makes sense. But I think one of the things that was striking is the decrease in their exercise capacity was present regardless of what their congenital heart disease lesion was. So it wasn't just the complex ones that had decreased exercise capacity, and more importantly, their exercise, objective exercise testing frequently did not match the patient reported symptoms. Patients obviously with uh, the more severe, the persistent cyanosis, Eisenmenger, single ventricle, those had the most significant impairment in MVO2 and that made sense. So we thought initially that maybe we could use CPET testing, our cardiopulmonary exercise testing, to help us predict who would develop heart failure. Unfortunately, that really hasn't held true. Part of that is because a lot of the patients do have a lower MVO2 at baseline, um, but there's also this narrow spectrum of range across the congenital heart line, uh, across the congenital heart disease spectrum. So it's kind of hard to draw like at this MVO2 is predictive of heart failure. Um, and so I think, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but I really would kind of propose that we should let a patient be their own predictor. Um, and let them establish their baseline, and a baseline when they're asymptomatic, according to them, to then be able to monitor what changes over time. So what else can we use? So what about just their symptoms? You know, NYHA class. We really, you know, had, there's a lot of data in that in acquired disease. But unfortunately, in congenital heart disease, that's not really that predictive either. And part of it's because, again, these patients have kind of never been, quote, normal. They've never, quote, had a normal exercise capacity. So for them, they don't perceive themselves as being limited. This is what they live with their entire life. And so they will tell you that, oh, I'm fine. I don't have any symptoms. I do what I want to do. But when we look at objective testing, they are substantially limited. And so it is hard um, just to go by what they uh, give you as their baseline. But what is important is when they do report a decrease in symptoms, or a decrease, sorry, in capacity, or an increase in symptoms, that has been substantially uh, linked to uh, a predictor of adverse events. So if you ever have an adult congenital patient who is telling you, hey, I can do less exercise capacity than I last time, hey, I'm not able to do stuff, you should pay attention to that because that probably means they're a lot more impaired than they even think that they are. So what about neurohormonal markers? Um, so BMP and pro-BMP, you know, 
they are often elevated at baseline in our adult congenital heart disease patients. And so there is some data with them. If we do have substantially elevated ones, and you could say is 282 really substantial, but um, that is associated with an increased event rate. So a greater, uh, in a study that looked at greater than 202 uh, pro-MPP was associated with a 65% increase, or a 65% event rate, and most of that was driven by heart failure and even sudden cardiac death. However, if you do have an adult congenital patient that has a low BMP, that's actually quite reassuring. Um, they're not that common. We also have to make sure that there are not other reasons that it could be low. But at the same time, if a low BMP has been associated with almost a 90% event rate over three and a half years. So kind of what can we look at? So what is helpful in predicting heart failure? So obviously more increased lesions. So the more complex their congenital heart disease, they're more likely they are to have heart failure. That makes sense. If they report a worsening NYHA class, so again, not the class that they report at baseline, but if they re report a worsening class, and BMP levels I think may be helpful. I think one of the things that's also important is what hasn't been shown to be reliable in predicting heart funds is actually their systemic ventricular function. So even if we see it and it's bad, we should pay attention to it, but that doesn't necessarily always correlate that they're going to develop heart failure. And, and of course, by data that we've shown in our own acquired HEFPEF patients, just because you have a normal EF doesn't mean you're not going to develop heart failure. The peak MVO2, although helpful, may be in following patients and letting them be their own baseline, but a single MVO2 point is not, hasn't been shown to be that predictable. And also some other things like hyponatremia and other options have not been shown to be uh, predictable, uh, reliable predictors for predicting heart failure. So what about, what happens and in, in how often do we see heart failure in our adult congenital population? Well, I think some of the first data uh, came from the Concord Registry, and the Concord Registry is actually a Dutch registry in the Netherlands. They have a very large population of data. And I think what you can see is they actually went back and looked at their registry versus a general population and looked like percentage of hospital admissions. And I want to draw your attention to the, the slash lines, the adult congenital population is obviously substantially higher rate of hospitalizations. But I think the thing that becomes striking is you start seeing people, you know, even in their 20s and 30s, having a 10% rate of hospitalizations. And when the registry went back and said, okay, why are these patients being hospitalized and what's their cause of death? You can look and see that chronic heart failure and sudden cardiac death make up about half of why our adult congenital patient populations were dying in this uh, registry. So other studies have kind of taken that a little bit further. This is a graph that I kind of like to look at. This is, again, from the Concord Registry. And it basically says who's going to develop heart failure. And in here, dark is bad. And what we see, there's a lot of dark across a lot of different congenital heart disease um, etiologies. But this is a graph that I actually kind of want to point out that I think really crystallizes things for me. And this they looked at um, a few different uh, types of congenital heart disease, single ventricles, tetralogy of Fallot, uh, your transposition patients, and look at the probability of uh, developing heart failure even by the time you're 20 or 30. And so a lot of these, almost 50% of these patients are going to develop heart failure in our complex uh, congenital heart disease by the time that they're 30 years old. Well, again, what happens if you do have heart failure? So this was a recently published uh, study uh, from Belgium, which looked at almost 4,000 patients. And they, again, kind of put their spectrum and, again, looked at the prevalence of developing heart disease and put it across all spectrums. And, again, now if you're getting into red, yellow and red is a lot of heart failure. And so are you can see, you know, even by the age of, you know, 15 to 35, uh, your um, Isaminger patients and your Fontan patients, substantial percentage of developing heart failure. And you're in their mid-30s to 50s. Um, that was a nice time of my life, mid-30s to 50s. Um, anyway, some heart failures developing there. And by the time you're over 50, we're seeing, you know, again, a lot of heart failure. But I think when we look at that as a port to mortality, this data, I think, really drove that home. If you look at our, these are in just adult congenital heart disease patients. If you didn't have heart failure, yeah, your mortality and survival is pretty good. But look if you do have heart failure. 
It's over a five-fold increase in mortality uh, once patients develop heart failure. And so again, heart failure is, and this was, um, they looked at it in, with a single hospital admission, there was a 25% risk of death within the first year following that admission. So again, just like in our acquired um, heart disease, heart disease in the congenital world is also a very um, morbid event that can have high mortality. This is a study, uh, this is actually a US study um, that actually looked at comparing hospital or emergency visits and hospitalizations and, and looked at mortality. And so when you look at the data, you can see that um, the patients who did not have heart failure, or sorry, who did not have congenital heart disease um, had a lower mortality than those who did have heart failure and the single ventricle patients um, even had a higher mortality uh, uh, when it looked at their admissions. And you may say, well, that's only a 1%, 1% difference, and that's true. But I would kind of say, look over to this right slide, because I think the part of this that really strikes me is Look at the ages of these patients. And so if you're looking at your, um, your Fontan patients, which are in black, um, your, and then just the rest of your two ventricle um, adult congenital heart patients with, font, with heart failure, compared to the non-heart failure, uh, non-congenital heart disease patients, look how much younger these patients are. So these patients are patients in their 20s, 30s, 40s, maybe 50s, and they're dying at a higher rate than our patients with heart failure from acquired heart disease in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. So I think this really kind of puts into perspective to me kind of um, the importance of really looking more at heart failure in our adult congenital um, population. Okay, so we said we know it. We kind of think we've defined it. It's bad. It has heart failure. What do we do about it? Well, I put this slide up, so this is a great uh, kind of slide that looks at all the studies that have driven our guidelines in acquired heart disease, in acquired heart failure. So you look at there's a lot of trials there that have, uh, and that, and then with that, we've been able to have a substantial, um, I think, evidence-based guideline of treating heart failure in acquired congenital heart, in, in acquired heart failure. Okay, well, what do those trials look like for um, those patients with adult congenital uh, heart disease? Oh, yeah, there's not any, really. What do we do with that? Why is that? And so I think we have to back up and remember that heart failure and congenital heart disease is a very complex group. And so you're starting that you honestly have a lot of phenotypes. So you've got a lot, a big spectrum of, of how their hearts were abnormal, how they were treated. Do they have one ventricle? Do they have two ventricles? Do they have a left ventricle? Do they have a right ventricle? Sometimes, honestly, it's hard to tell. I'm very thankful that I have Dr. Duarte who can look at MRIs and tell me, is it an RV or LV? Because sometimes you just can't tell by looking at just some of their structural things. Also, they frequently will have residual lesions. Maybe they have recoarct. Reco Maybe they still have valvular disease. Maybe they have anomalous coronary arteries that are going with their um, structural, other structural abnormalities. Again, we already talked about the fact that we really don't know the best prognostic signs. Heck, we're not even really sure how to define heart failure. So how do we really set up trials to be appropriate? How do we make sure we're looking at the same endpoints? Um, and then we get into a lot of the unique challenges that we have in these. And we also, you know, need to acknowledge that as a healthcare community, we really don't do the best job of keeping these patients integrated in healthcare. Um, and we lose a lot of patients in that transition from their pediatrician to the adult cardiology world. And so there's usually a substantial gaps where they're not receiving any care. So it, it does create a substantial challenge as to how we look at trying to treat these patients. I think this is a nice kind of diagram to kind of look at if you're seeing a, a patient with uh, adult congenital heart disease and we're, and we're really kind of focusing of that preventative arm of thinking of that heart failure. And so we should always obviously do a clinical examination of the patient. That all, that, that's not a... a a data extraction from the computer, that actually means going, talking, putting hands on the patient and using that thing that we wear around our neck that frequently is jewelry called a stethoscope. 
um, to look at that. Um, really can get a lot of data from our adult congenital patients from physical exam and from taking a very good history. Um, then we need to find, do we think that they have heart failure symptoms? Yes or no? Again, even for me, that can be challenging sometimes to figure out where their limitations are. But if we think they're no, then we need to look and say, okay, we, we need to acknowledge that they have a risk of developing progressive heart failure. And so we need to make sure that they're, you know, A, plugged into a system and they understand the importance of continuing to establish care and to main, maintain good follow-up. I am a big proponent of also getting objective baseline testing in all of my adult congenital patients, especially with moderate to complex disease. Um, and that includes advanced imaging, and also because I'm a heart failure doctor, I think that there's a huge advantage in getting cardiopulmonary stress test testing at a baseline. Because you let patients set their own baseline. Um, and that can be incredibly important because many times, like we said, they will have a reduced MVO2. And so if you get their exercise capacity and, and they come in and they're saying they're more short of breath and you see that they're 50% of predicted, well, that sounds really bad, but I don't know what they were a year ago. Maybe they were 48% of predicted a year ago and now with our meds are actually better and we have other things that we need to look at. So I'm a very big proponent in getting a lot of baseline testing and that really, for me, is an echo, advanced imaging with MRI or CT and a, a cardiopulmonary exercise stress test, um, and baseline labs, including a BMP, um, to really kind of get a stay so you can follow them. Obviously, if we start seeing that they have progressive or decompensating heart failure, we need to make sure we're looking for other reasons, um, checking to see, do they have other valvular issues? Have they have obstruction in any of their repairs? Do they have a residual shunt? We also have to remember, and we in the adult congenital population of caregivers have to remind ourselves that our patients are not immune to regular heart disease either. So, you know, have they developed hypertension? Have they developed COPD? Have they developed coronary artery disease? Um, which can be particularly important in a systemic right ventral because they only have one coronary artery that's probably feeding most of their functional myocardium. Um, so we need to look for all of the um, reasons that may be reversible. Um, also want to make sure that they don't have um, EP problems, electrophysiology problems. Those of you who know me know that I hate EP. Bless all of the EP people. Thank you for taking care of my patients. I ask a lot of you in our adult congenital world because they have a lot of EP problems. Thank you because I get vagal myself trying to figure out some of the complex EP physiology their adult congenital patient populations have, but it's a critical part of their health care uh, because they are very vulnerable for not only arrhythmias, but conduction disorders, and then they face a lot of challenges with how you address them because, again, anatomy isn't normal. Once we do all those things, then, you know, it goes to consideration of heart failure medical therapy. Okay. What are we going to consider and what are we going to look at? So I want to go through and kind of break it through a little bit of different types of congenital heart disease because I do think that this is where the field is moving. I don't think that we can say anymore, just like we can't say anymore for, you know, all heart failure in the, uh, the normal non-congenital heart failure population that all medicines work the same. I think we're, in, we're going to have to work our way through and look at specific different lesions um, to be able to say, Okay, how do we treat these patients? Well, let's start with the patients that have four chambers, two ventricles, and the ventricle that pumps to the body is the LV. So these are a lot are going to be like your coarc patients, your AV canal patients, uh, your bicuspid aortic valve patients, maybe your PDA patients. So there's a large your VSD patients, ASD patients. There's a large group of patients that fit into this category. And so actually, what we have shown is that if it's a systemic LV and you're a four chamber and you have LV dysfunction, that we should use the data and extrapolate the data from our acquired heart failure. Now we understand that we're extrapolating. We understand that, there, we, that we can't say for sure that these data are going to help. Um, and this should be for both systolic and diastolic heart failure. And so we should use the data that we have. I think it's important that we explain to patients that, you know, we can't guarantee that these patients, are, that these medications are going to be beneficial for them. 
but that's saying based on the data that we have that we think it is likely to be. And that's actually been shown uh, in a paper that was just published um, actually uh, in, this, in last year, which looked at patients that had left ventricular systolic dysfunction um, and the role of conventional medical therapy. And what we saw was that with guideline-directed therapy that we saw an improvement in their LV function um, with both medical therapy, with CRT, um, and actually you even saw some benefit in the LV dysfunction if you could work on things that were making their RV bad. And so most of these are going to be valvular interventions um, that, that were used in this, um, this study. And I think this really highlights the point um, that it appears, at least for that, in the congenital heart disease patients, they may have more ventricular interdependence. And so what I mean by that, if you have a right ventricle that's incredibly enlarged and dilated, and we'll talk about a case in particular of where that is, it is, it is more likely to affect your LV as well. Um, and so if we need to make sure that we're continuing to keep that in mind about that ventricular interdependence, and if we can work on things um, that can make the right ventricle better, and we'll talk about our limitations there, that that actually may help the left ventricle get better as well. So let's jump over into uh, when we have a subpulmonic ventricle, um, that's the RV, and we start having dysfunction in that ventricle. And so what's the classic of that? That's going to be your tetralogy of Fallot patient, okay? So is your te repair tetralogy of Fallot. Uh, remember, many of these patients, especially back up until this last decade, when they repaired their tetralogy of Fallot, they actually basically just cut away their pulmonary valve. And so many of these patients were left with wide open pulmonary regurgitation, and the thought was, you don't need a pulmonary valve. They'll be fine. Well, they were fine for many years until they continued to live. And then they became not so fine. Um, and so many of these patients do have uh, dilated RVs. And honestly, just even in our patients that have valve sparing um, surgeries continue to have some RV dysfunction. And so there's been a number of trials that have looked at, well, can we treat the RV, in particularly in tetralogy of fellow patients, um, with some of our other trials, specifically looking at ACEs and ARBs. And there was initially some thought that maybe some things would get better, but unfortunately, the data really hasn't shown that out. That there, we haven't, we don't have consistent um, data that shows that we have a benefit of treating RV failure in tetralogy patients with uh, ACEs or ARBs. What we do know, and what I will uh, bring to your attention, is if people still, if their uh, tetralogy fellow patients have residual significant pulmonary valve regurgitation that when the RV reaches uh, greater than 150 mils per meter squared, some people may even argue you could go in certain cases a little bit smaller, or they have RV dysfunction or deterioration in exercise capacity, they should undergo a pulmonary valve replacement intervention, whether that be percutaneous with a lot of our uh, options there or even surgical if needed. Um, and so uh, this is something that has been shown over and over again so something to keep in mind of your tetralogy patients, um, even if their RV is normal function, um, if it's uh, incredibly dilated, um, that that uh, valvular disease needs to be addressed. And even in patients who have severe pulmonary, uh, uh, severe right ventricular enlargement and depressed function, repairing of the pulmonary valve has been imp still improved symptoms and exercise capacity. So may not improve their RV may not completely remodel and the function go back to normal, but symptomatically um, they will have a benefit. So what do we recommend in our patients with a subpulmonary uh, RV failure? Um, in asymptomatics, unless they have the pulmonary valve regurgitation that we talked about in tetralogy fallot, there's really no medical therapy that we recommend. So if you have a low EF on your right side and you're asymptomatic, as much as we want to do something, we don't have data to really support doing that. If you're symptomatic um, and if you have uh, pulmonary uh, arterial hypertension, then obviously we need to treat their PAH. Um, and the, the PD-5 inhibitors and the ERAs have the most data in congenital heart disease, but we're starting to get more with the prostacyclin analogs. And obviously if they're symptomatic, then you can use diuretics as well. 
If you have a symptomatic patient with RV failure, if they're not hypertensive, if they're not diabetic, there's really, at this point, no indication to treat with ACE, ARBs, beta blockers. We just don't have the data to show that it's better. So for just treating the RV failure, I would not start medications um, uh, just for that. Let's move over to the systemic right ventricle. This is kind of a personal uh, passion of mine, of patients who are born with a systemic RV. And so these are really going to be talking about now, most commonly you're kind of talking about your detransposition patients um, that had a, the uh, atrial switch years ago, so your mustards or your sinnings. And so now all of a sudden we moved your arteries, and so your RV is pumping to your body. The other case that this is is in uh, L transposition or con congenitally corrected transposition to where patients were just born where their ventricle switched. And so their um, RV is, has, is and has always been pumping blood to their body. So what data do we have there? Well, again, we, and we've had several things that have looked at it, but I also want to point out, you may have noticed this before, when we look at these trials, just look at the numbers of patients. And we're really talking about just small handfuls of patients that have really been studied. But unfortunately, even of looking at um, beta blockers, really didn't see any uh, sustained or consistent benefit of treating patients with a systemic RV. Same thing of looking at ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Not really any sustained ben benefit that's predictive of treating the systemic RV, which kind of goes back to what we saw with our tetralogy patients. Well, should that be surprising to us? Is it surprising to us that the RV doesn't respond to medications just like the LV does? I would say no. We need to remember that the RV has never been the same as the LV. Um, it is actually derived embryologically from completely different tissue. So the left ventricle is uh, derived from the primary heart field. The right ventricle is derived from the secondary heart field. And the secondary heart field is more like vasculature or endothelium. So genetically, embryonically, they were never the same to ever begin with. And then when we look at other stuff, even as we look at morphologically, we need to step back and remember that they're also very different. The right ventricle is formed of two layers um, that's mostly longitudinal shortening. The left ventricle is formed of three layers that's mostly circ circumferential uh, shortening. So they even behave differently. And we can go through all the list that shows here of that they're, they're very different um, in their makeup and how they perform and how do they respond to other stressors. So it shouldn't be surprising to us that they don't, re they don't respond the same to different medical therapy. And I will you know, remind you that 10 to 15 percent of all congenital uh, heart disease patients have a systemic ventricle that's an RV, whether it's in a dual or single circulation. So there's a lot of these patients out there. So do we have any hope of systemic RV? Is there anything new out there? And there's actually some very exciting studies about using Entresto, uh, Sabicatril Valsartan. So there's been two studies that have recently been published, actually this year, um, that have looked at using uh, Entresto in patients with at least moderate RV dysfunction. And this is on top of their other medical therapy that honestly we're throwing at them because we as physicians feel like we have to give them something because we can't just say we don't have anything. So we do extrapolate and use other medicines. And what um, the first study in, uh, showed that they had an increased six minute walk distance. There was an improvement in their actually RV function and a reduction of their NP, uh, in uh, terminal pro BMP. And that was in 35 patients. And then a single study, uh, a single center study from Italy also reported data in the same, in the same set, setting of patients from 50 patients with systemic right ventricles. And then they also saw an increase in RV function, they had a decrease in actually tricuspid valve regurgitation, so maybe looked at some remodeling. Um, and it, again, increased six minute walk distance and improved NYHA class. And so I think the jury's still out a little bit. Um, I would caution us to all get on the Entresto boat because we've kind of seen some of these where some initial studies looked impressive. But I do think it's something um, to be, uh, continue to be explored. And I will say in, from personal um, experience, I've had several of my, especially the detransposition patients, really respond well to Entresto. Um, so I think it's something that we will continue to look at and explore. There always becomes a question of what about CRT in, in systemic right ventricles? 
What about cardiac resynchronization therapy? So initial studies actually showed that there was a lower response rate in, of CRT to systemic right ventricles, because remember the conduction system in the right ventricle is different than the conduction system in the left ventricle. Um, but newer studies have actually shown um, that maybe that they will respond, and especially in the congenitally corrected or L transposition patients. Um, and the other thing I will point out is there's uh, kind of increased uh, appreciation that the systemic right ventricle um, may be more susceptible of developing pacing-induced cardiomyopathy. And so if you're pacing the other, you know, just uh, ventricularly pacing, that it appears to be more susceptible. There was a nice um, kind of paper that actually uh, came out this year um, that looked at that that showed uh, kind of um, the comparison of looking at all the studies that we have of looking at cardiac resynchronization. And what you can see is the non-responder rate of uh, CRT in systemic right ventricles was actually not that high. Um, and this was graphically shown um, that looks at um, patients who have systemic right ventricles compared to not. And you can see that, again, there's a high rate of responders. So I will say, you know, I'm warming up to that. You know, I think, again, decades ago, we really weren't sure that doing CRT in our systemic right ventricle patients were going to be beneficial. I think there's increasing data um, that maybe it will be. And I also will give a shout out to our EP uh, colleagues because I also think they're becoming more um, in tune and, and more um, experienced at making sure we're getting good pacing um, locations and spending a lot of time actually trying to narrow that QRS and, and, and honestly a lot of time and effort because sometimes and not infrequently this can't be done um, endovascularly. A lot of times we even have to look at epicardial pacing in a lot of our patients, especially obviously in our single ventricles. And so I think we need to um, give appreciation to our EP teams for the efforts that they've put in because I really think increased uh, improvements in technique um, have helped us see improvement. So what about systemic RV dysfunction? In asymptomatic patients, even if their RVEF is low, I would say we really don't have a role for medical therapy in that we don't have enough data to show that if someone doesn't have heart failure, that they would benefit from medications. In symptomatic patients, I think we can use the standard LV heart failure therapies, but again, we, we need to disclose to our patients that we're not sure that this is gonna help um, and really watch for side effects. I think that there are promising um, uh, data with Subiquitil and uh, Valsartan, so maybe we should prioritize Entresto, and uh, again, looking at, at CRT. If we're going to extrapolate our conventional therapy, I would say we need to keep in mind that we need to watch for side effects. So beta blockers in particular, we need to watch for development of conduction abnormalities, especially in your uh, transposition patients because they're going to be prone for that. So we need to make sure we're not making them worse by trying to make them better. And in the same of our vasodilatator therapies, especially in our detransposition that have the baffles, some of their baffles can be more rigid and have obstruction. And if we vasodilate them, on the, we may be compromising some of their cardiac output. So again, we need to use these cautiously and thoughtfully and watching for side effects. Now we're gonna switch over to the last group, our single ventricle, our Fontan patients. Again, the group that actually is probably increasing most in um, percentage of adulthood just because of the great Im surgical improvements that's been in the hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So we also are, need to remember in our Fontan po po population, there's actually kind of four different kinds of failure. So you've got the systolic dysfunction, we've got the diastolic dysfunction or HEFPEF, but we also have failure that comes more from cirrhotic dysfunction because we know that our Fontan patients, because of the increased um, passive venous pressure, are going to be more predisposed to developing liver failure. So a lot of times they will have symptoms that are real more secondary from cirrhosis. Um, and then also we have lymphatic involvement, such as PLE or plastic bronchitis, which is a whole nother group um, of failure. There's been just a few studies of looking at conventional heart failure therapies in Fontans. Um, and really, we really haven't seen any real benefit of conventional therapies. Um, over the la or about a decade ago, there was great excitement in using pulmonary vasodilators in Fontan patients because remember, in Fontan, since they only have a single ventricle, the blood flow through their pulmonary system is passive. And so any pulmonary vascular resistance, you know, can obviously impair that blood flow. And so 
Well, there really was a look at um, using pulmonary vasodilators, the, um, the PDE5 inhibitors, and the endothelial receptor antagonist. Um, but unfortunately, a recent meta-analysis has shown that we do can see improved hemodynamics and functional class and exercise capacity. So symptomatically, we can make them feel better. But unfortunately, at this time, we haven't seen a mortality benefit with the use of this. So I think in symptomatic patients um, or in patients that, were, that have decreased exercise capacity, uh, looking at using the pulmonary vasodilators is definitely something that can be explored, um, but we're still uh, waiting to see if we can get mortality effect. So kind of in our Fontan patients, again, if you're asymptomatic and you have normal pressures, you could argue that you really, there's no data for using medical therapy in these patients. If you have patients that do have elevated pulmonary pressures or maybe have some symptoms of exercise incapacity, and they don't have an elevated ventricular diastolic pressure or substantially elevated, then using um, the, PDF, the, the pulmonary vasodilator therapies is very reasonable, and many times it's very well tolerated. In symptomatic patients, um, we can employ standard heart failure patients, but this is a group that I would say that I would, this really needs to be co-management with an adult congenital specialist because we need to look at some of the cautions and uh, the risk of making some of these patients worse. So with systemic vasodilators, we have to be quite careful because many of them do have a low SVR at baseline because of their liver disease. And so if we vasodilate them any, even more, if they have residual intracardiac shunts, we can make them more blue because as you decrease their systemic vascular resistance, you can increase the right to left shunting. Um, and so you can make them more cyanotic. We can also decrease their cardiac output um, because a lot of these patients may not have a lot of preload reserve, and so as you, again, continue to vasodilate them, both pulmonary-wise and um, systemic-wise, they're not getting their cardiac output. Um, and again, also we can worsen some of the hepatorenal side effects of having a low SVR. So we just have to be careful. Again, um, and I will say the same with beta blockers that we talked about before, our Fontan patients are also um, are, um, susceptible to conduction disease, and so we need to just make sure we're not worsening conduction disease um, with beta blockers. And then I would just remind you that routine diuretic therapy for Fontan patients needs to be used with caution. Again, remember their pulmonary vasculature is this passive feeding into their, um, into their lungs, which comes back to their systemic ventricle. Um, and if we, if we really dry them out and get a normal JVP, you're really going to be decreasing their preload. And so remember that a normal Fontan pressure, especially in adult, is somewhere around 12 to 14. So if you have a JVP of 6, that person's going to be struggling because they're not going to be getting the preload that they need. Um, so just kind of remember to keep that in mind. So when we look at stuff with heart failure and congenital heart disease, we kind of talked about, we went through, I mean, we really are kind of struggling a little bit for what medical therapy that we need. But I can't wear my other, I can't have my other hat of being an advanced heart failure doctor without talking a little bit about some of the advanced heart failure uh, options in patients where our medical therapies don't work. And so when we look at things like transplant and congenital heart disease, although it's a small percentage, it's continuing to increase over time. And our adult congenital patients, their transplant characteristics are quite different. And they will have um, their pre-transplant mortality can be a lot higher than our uh, patients with acquired heart disease um, just because of all of the comorbidities that we talked about from before. Interestingly, when we look at comparing patients with congenital heart disease to non-congenital heart disease who are listed for transplant, what we can see is they are a very different population. They're typically younger, about 15 years younger in average than patients with acquired heart disease. They actually have lower comorbidities. They don't smoke as much, they don't have as much diabetes, they don't have as much hypertension, because again, they're younger. Um, they typically have a lower BMI, and in some ways that's good, but unfortunately, um, when we look at the registry, about 11% of adult uh, congenital heart disease patients who are listed for transplant had a BMI less than 18. So you, some of these were really looking at this malnourished state, um, which can be a risk factor for transplant. They've had a lot of surgeries. So twice as likely, to, they're twice the rate of prior sternotomies, they're three times as likely to have pulmonary hypertension, lower risk of PRAs, um, but I think the last two is what really strikes me. They have longer times on the wait list, and few of them are actually make it to transplant because of the comorbidities that they have. When they do get transplanted, though, however, um, you know, the outcomes are improving. 
So we acknowledge that the 30-day mortality in congenital heart disease patients is higher, typically because they're more complex going in. Um, but once they get out of that, what we've shown is in the conditional one-year survival, look at the blue line, this is your congenital heart disease patients. So if they survive their first year after transplant, they have shown to have a, a significantly increased survival. We're looking at your congenital heart disease um, survival is 20 years conditional if they make it through their first year uh, compared to um, 12 to 14 of our other acquired heart disease. So it's the cost up front um, with our congenital heart disease patients, um, but frequently they can have very good outcomes. If we look at ventricular cyst devices in congenital heart disease patients, we really have limited information. Um, there has been uh, multiple cases where we can do VAD placements in systemic uh, right ventricles for either D transposition or L transpositions. I know we've done some here at Houston Methodist. At my previous institution in Minnesota, we did several as well um, with our correct surgical expertise that these can be done well and they can have very good outcomes. Um, the single ventricle VADs is another, another story. We're still learning how to actually try to have mechanical support in a single ventricle VAD. Um, and they typically do have a lot of surgical uh, challenges and complex courses. Um, however, again, um, if we looked at the data um, from the Intermax data from 2018, um, although they had a higher rate of early renal dysfunction, um, there was no uh, difference in uh, rehospitalization, neurological events, bleeding events, infection, or the need for advice exchange, and both, patient, both groups actually um, experience similar improvement in functional class and quality of life and improvement in exercise capacity. So even though they're more challenging, we can get these patients through this and they do well. So in summary, what I would say is the population of adults with con complex congenital heart disease continues to increase. Many of these patients will develop heart failure and they're going to be in our adult cardiology clinics and in our world. So we need to embrace them and figure out a way to co collaboratively care for them. They have unique um, outcome predictors. Just like with acquired heart failure, heart failure and congenital heart disease is significantly associated with increased morbidity and mortality. We need more trials to figure out how to best medically treat these patients, especially looking at specific um, uh, disease states. Um, and then if we do need to move to advanced therapies, um, that the both transplant and VAD outcomes um, are um, are good, but not quite as good as some of our acquired, but I think as we're continuing to get better, those outcomes to continue to improve. And so with that, I'll stop and be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Uh, quite a challenging topic, and I think uh, very interesting also from a physiology point of view, and, and also that we have more patients with adult congenital heart disease that are surviving. You need experts to be able, and you need a team. You know, I think I'm very proud of our comprehensive program for adult congenital heart disease. And I know you mentioned Dr. Duarte, Dr. Lin, our uh, new surgeon that will be joining us, Dr. Corti, for adult congenital heart disease. And that, Actually, we've done quite a few of these patients, you know, transplantations for adult congenital heart disease. It is complex, but I was very encouraged that actually their prognosis, once they go through the acute, uh, uh, is their prognosis even better than most of the others. We'll take some questions. Dr. Bamiraj. Thank you. I think this is a very uh, area that's needed investment, and we appreciate your triple threat, and we're, we appreciate you being here. Um, I think one of the systematic questions, like before you came here, our expertise for ACHD existed. We had expertise for heart failure. Luckily, our, the husband of our ACHD became a heart, advanced heart failure, guys. I'm sure, like all wives train us, she trained him. <laughs> and Ryan, Ryan proclaimed as the ACHD heart failure person. My question is, as these patient populations evolve into heart failure, is there an opportunity to create heart failure ACHD specialists and either a certification through societies for ACHD specifically, because it depends on you know, how those specialties interact. 
Yeah. No, it's a great question. And, you know, and um, I think I was fortunate enough to kind of evolve into the role that I did. Um, and really, it was an, in some ways a little bit of an unintentional evolution. Um, mine really came from my, as Dr. Zogby talked about, my background in basic scientists was, was really in cardiac development. And so that's how I really started looking at congenital heart disease and being, you know, just fascinated um, by the cardiac development and the complexity of it. Um, and then continue to evolve in that, in, you know, with, with heart failure. I think it is very important that there is that collaboration between heart failure and adult congenital heart disease. Um, I think you can honestly make that with collaboration with heart failure and many other subspecialties as we've started to see there. Um, I think a challenge of creating a subspecialty, an advanced heart failure, adult congenital cardiologist, it, are you going to require another year in each? You know, what does that look like? I think that's challenging. Um, I do think that, you know, um, we as the adult cardiology um, population, I think we need to invest more time in training and expertise of our adult cardiologists into um, congenital heart disease. And I think the same thing for our heart failure, the, the adult heart failure, we need to really focus on congenital heart disease, uh, heart failure there because it's coming more and more. I don't know if we'll ever have like a, you know, an adult congenital heart failure certification. I think that may be a little bit much because um, we're struggling to just get adult congenital heart disease specialist um, to be able to care for the community. I mean, I think it's less than 10% of the adult congenital heart disease population is actually cared for by an adult congenital uh, specialist as it is. Um, mm -hmm. But I think creating that partnership, um, and I think there's many institutions, you know, um, like you guys had here that was incredibly, you know, um, functional and worked very well of having that pairing with your adult congenital uh, cardiologist and your heart failure specialist to be on that same team. Um, I mean, I would love to have more people like me who kind of do both, you know, because I think it's a, an amazing, uh, rewarding field. Um, but I think kind of mandating it or creating especially, I think probably we're not ready for that yet. I may take a liberty of a second question because I'll probably email you a lot of questions. You stimulated <laughs> a lot of thoughts. Um, biologically, I mean, it's fascinating. As you mentioned, you know, we've recognized RV comes from a different area. but. As you know, the area of investment in the lab for me has been the endothelial mesenchymal transitioning. It's interesting that that's a key component in embryology. Mm -hmm. And then these individuals don't fibrose as much. In adulthood, that transition contributes to fibrosis. So is there any genomic studies showing mon mono or multi-genomic reasons why the systemic RV you know, doesn't become the way it is? And is there opportunity for like CRISPR in the future if yeah. you're able to identify a few genes. Yes, now you stepped into my really happy world place. Um, that's some of the things that I've been looking at and, and, and other people have looked at as well of looking at the genetic differences, the, the both genetically through RNA-seq and proteomically through metabolomics of looking at the difference between the LV and the RV. And yes, they're different. Um, we, I think the problem is, is there are many places that they're different, and how do we know where the, what's the important places of what they're different? Um, we actually um, looked at a model where we took, um, now I'm going to back up a second to talking about a little bit of, of kind of basic science, but if you remember, when we are embryos, we all have a, basically a systemic RV because we have, we have um, circulations in parallel um, because obviously we're not breathing, our lungs are expanding, and so the right ventricle is very hypertrophied embryologically. And so if you look at an, a, an unborn embryo, and if you compare RV to LV, the size of the ventricular walls are the same. Um, as soon as we are born, and as soon as we take that deep breath, um, within 24 hours, the RV pressures drop dramatically to where they're about, you know, the normal quarter if they have of the LV, and what we see is regression of that RV hypertrophy uh, down to a thin walled state. And so we actually went back and looked in, 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 in a pig model, which is you know, genetically as close to humans as we have in the non-primate. Um, we actually looked at and took LV and RV samples from uh, embryo, embryonic pigs that were one, less than a week from being born. And then we took them at a week after birth and then a month after birth and then look to see what was changed. And then just recently with using our 
a large animal model that we did of PA banding, then we PA banded them and then looked when it rehypertrophied to look to see, you know, what was turned off and then what was turned back on. So hopefully we'll be getting some ideas looking at that of trying to, to tease out where the places to look at. But there are definitely some metabolic signals and some proteonic signals um, that we've been working on. Thank you, Cindy, for that uh, uh, fantastic talk. Um, my question is, you know, in, in Fontans, uh, at least for use of uh, PD-5 inhibitors, there is a lower PVR cutoff and lower PVRI cutoff. But do you think this is something that we should consider in tetralogy of follow? Because I think, uh, you know, to be honest with you, this is the only population where they really looked at RVPA coupling in, in Fontans, and actually it worked. And so, but um, is, is it something that should be considered in other... Uh, other failing RVs? Yeah, I, th I think that's a good question. Um, I don't think we have enough information to say for sure. Um, I think if you, I think if, and we also, I want to back up and say too, when we look at, when we uh, give the definition of a failing RV or RV depressed function in the tetralogy patients, we need to make sure that we're um, reporting that accurately. And again, we're very lucky here because we have amazing imaging. But we remember that we have a big transannular patch and so a lot of, that's not going to move. It's not muscle. And so we can't take that into account when we're calculating the uh, ejection fraction of the right ventricle. So we need to make sure we look at actually the functional RV myocardium. And in many of those patients, that, that myocardium is actually good. Um, I do think in some of them, you know, it's very reasonable. Now, we also have to remember in our tetralogy patients that almost, at least initially, almost all of them, their pulmonary vasculature was protected because they had severe PS. And so they didn't have a lot of the, you know, the remodeling that happened before. And so that's where I don't know if we'll see a lot of the benefit because their pulmonary vasculature, its changes was very different than some of the others. So something very interesting of looking at, I agree, I think the RV to PA coupling is a very interesting um, area that's getting more and more importance and something to look at. But right now I would say we don't have the data to say to use that. Other questions? Dr. Martin, thank you so much. I, I think so great realization on significant heart failure, subclinical heart failure, the need for early detection recognition, GDMT in this space. Now, as they are living more, another thing that I feel is slightly more under-recognized is the atherosclerotic risk factors. Of course, we don't see a lot of diabetes, obesity, smoking, but uh, recent insights have suggested significant dyslipidemia, even in age 35, mm -hmm. multiple risk factors, progression of risk factors. You have tremendous amount of endothelial dysfunction, which is a major risk factor for atherosclerotic cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease. So do you think that we have an opportunity to expand the scope for comprehensive care for atherosclerotic disease risk assessment and management as they live beyond just heart failure? Oh, absolutely. And that's one of the things that I kind of pointed out is as we're getting older, we have to keep that in mind. And there's certain congenital heart disease um, states that we know have an increased risk, like coarctation. I mean, it's been associated with having an increased risk of coronary artery disease. Now, whether that's coupled because they have more hypertension, and you know, and so the hypertension is the risk, or if it's something endothelial-wise, we know that you know even in in coarctation that the whole aorta has more of a is abnormal, and so it's not just a coarct site. Um, so completely agree. I think that we need to be very aggressive at risk factor modification, and I really talk about that with all of my patients, especially those, you know, who already have compromised, you know, function, because I can say you can't take another hit, you know, that we really, and so I am, I completely agree. I think we have to be very aggressive at risk factor modification and also education uh, of that and explaining to why that is important, um, and I think that we I think frequently that we get so, we kind of lose the forest for the tree sometimes in our congenital heart disease patients, uh, especially, you know, when they're not followed in a, a, in a subspecialty clinic because we get so overwhelmed with a congenital heart disease that we forget about the other things. And I think continuing to highlight those is very important. The other thing I would, just two little things that bring up to that. Number one, I would, we really need to reemphasize the importance of exercise. A lot of these patients, for decades ago, we're told not to exercise and actually were limited in their exercise because we were just naive and we didn't understand that that was a bad thing to do. Um, and so, yeah, I don't want them going out, you know, running a Boston Marathon after when they first, the first thing they're going to say that they want to do or go hike Kilimanjaro. But at the same time, we need to encourage them to be active. 
We need, and there's multiple studies that have shown that exercise uh, training will improve uh, symptoms um, and uh, outcomes with congenital heart disease patients. Um, and then the second thing, and this isn't related to this, but I'm just going to plug in because I just remembered. Um, I think we also have to be very careful with our words when we talk to patients. And one of the most things that I will say is when we talk about patients, especially women who have congenital heart disease, we need to talk to them about pregnancy and reproduction. But please be careful with the use. And, and I've seen many times where people have been told that they can't have children. They hear this their entire life. And when I talk to them, many women think they physically can't have children. And so they don't use birth control. They don't do stuff because people have been told they, you can't have kids. Not, you should not have kids. <laughs> and so even though it's just a simple difference when you hear it over and over, you know, and so I think, again, it just it, it shows the, the power of words um, um, and, and using that. But definitely, we didn't even touch on it. But that's another kind of passion of mine is talking about reproduction and um, contraception and things in the congenital patient population and in our women, our young women with heart disease in general. Seems no other questions. Thank you, Cindy, for for a lecture. I just you know something that we talk about every day. You know, you know, I mean, you identify. I said it's a challenge to identify the definition of a heart failure in adult congenital, and you talked about after you know transplant LVAD, obviously there's there's option for them and you know they, they do relatively well after transplant. I think something we struggle even the place like this that we have a comprehensive ACHD team and advanced heart failure transplant, something that we struggle every day to identify when we should mm -hmm. think about advanced therapy in this patient. I think because you know the the usual risk stratification that we have with the CPET or right heart catheterization, <coughs> whatever we do I think it's not necessary to apply for these patients. I just want to get your perspective on that to see how do you approach this yeah. patient, when do you think about advanced therapy for this patient? Yeah, I mean, I think as we, you know, I kind of illustrated, we don't even really know how to define heart failure <laughs> in some of these patients, you know, and so, and when is it advanced heart failure where they will benefit from, um, you know, uh, advanced therapy options, I think is incredibly challenging. Um, I, I think as, as we have done and as you've done before me, I think, again, it's really using the patient as their own, you know, uh, of looking at that deterioration. That's what that baseline testing and stuff is, good, you know, to get that. Because like you said, I mean, you know, in our normal acquired disease, if you have an MVO2 less than 50%, that's been associated with, you know, substantially um, adverse outcome over a short period of time, and that's why it's an indication for transplant. We don't have that data, and the data actually doesn't support that with congenital heart disease as far as, far as being prognostic. So I think it, it, I think it really is looking at the delta. I think that's as far as exercise capacity and some of those things. Um, I also think it's starting to look at other end organ compromise. And I think sometimes, in all honesty, we probably transplant them a little bit early from a heart standpoint um, because they're starting to get end organ compromised, kidney, renal, other stuff. And so we want to try to avoid some of, you know, of those things. Um, I will say, though, in general, um, although I think <laughs> we struggle at when is it, you know, um, are we doing it too soon? Unfortunately... <laughs> In the general population, many of them, it's they're they're waited way too late, and so I think you know getting those into that into the um, into a multidisciplinary team to be able to look and follow that. I, I don't. I mean, honestly, I don't have a great answer, and I really think at this point, it's still really just going to be expert discussion and opinion with a subspecialty group to try to figure out individually for each patient. Um, it's just really hard. One last question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to segue to that and say to all those ACHD cardiologists that are thinking, should I refer this patient for transplant or not, refer. Yeah. Uh, it's an evaluation. Mm -hmm. So there will be a multidisciplinary evaluation and discussion with the referring. And then if it's too early, we'll define that together. Um, and then for Dr. Martin, I would like to ask her, what's her advice for a those transplant centers, as we pre for transplant centers who do not transplant congenital heart disease patients, on how to prepare for the wave of patients that we are expecting. Yeah, so I think you know, creation of that multidisciplinary team. I mean, I think that this is a population that, with its complete complexity, you can't do without a multidisciplinary team.
And it's honestly, it's not just the heart failure physicians. It's not just the surgeons. It's not just the ACHD people. It's the respiratory therapy techs. It's the nurses. It's the, you know, it's, the, it's our EP colleagues. It's our hepatology colleagues. It's our renal colleagues. It's our maternal fetal medicine colleagues. I mean, it is a truly a comprehensive medical care team. And I think that has been shown repeatedly that the best outcomes are in places that create those um, comprehensive care teams. I think that this is another one of those institutions that we as a, a healthcare community have to put our pride and ego in check and realize that there, we can't recapitulate these centers at every place and every center can't be experts in every disease. And so I think that's where we have to say of like, okay, and I will give you a complete example. When I was at University of Minnesota, we had an amazing adult congenital program. But 90 miles away, I had one of the world's experts in Epstein surgery. I'm not gonna recapitulate an, a surgery. I'm gonna send them to that person. Like that's what we need to do. And I think continuing to keep that the patient focus in, in making the best decisions for our patients, but also imploring our hospital systems to help us provide the resources because they are a resource intense uh, need group, but ignoring them doesn't make them go away. You know, they're going to be there, they're gonna be more, and if we continue to ignore them, they're going to be sicker and harder to take care of and require a higher cost burden and resource burden. So I think trying as much as we can, as you said, to create those teams, to partner, to create, create networks of referral. Um, again, we don't have to recapitulate everything at every place, but we have to have touch points and connections. And I completely agree with you, um, Dr. Duarte, that talking about transplant and advanced therapies is something that really needs to happen with our complex patients, really when they're teenagers. We know that Fontans are not going to make it to 40, 50, 60 without other interventions. We know that DTGA patients, we know that L, eh, L transposition is a little bit, some of them, but the data shows us they're, they're going to need more stuff. And so if we start talking to them and preparing them for this, it's so much easier on the patient when they say like, okay, I, I knew this was something I'm going to be able to talk about. I knew this is something that, you know, was probably going to be coming my way as opposed to when they're 35 years old and in the hospital and, you know, like dying and we're like, we need a transplant. And they're like, what? Nobody ever told me I was going to need this. I had the surgery. It was supposed to fix me. And I think that we just, it's hard conversations to have for people, especially when they're younger of saying, if we look at the data, you know, you're going to develop heart failure in your 30s and, and that you may not live past your 40s and 50s, but it's the data. And so I think being able to talk with them and let them know what that is in a very, you know, safe place um, and then to be able to help them work their way through that um, is very important for our patients and for their families. Well, I mean, this is a great discussion. I just want to end it with a comment and a challenge. One of the comments is you heard from two people who are sitting together, and you can have the camera right there, <clears throat> Dr. Yusuf Zai and Dr. Duarte. How best can you have a collaborative team <laughs> who collaborate in life, at home, and here complement each other from an adult congenital heart disease and advanced heart failure transplantation point of view? So thank you for everything you do. And the last is a challenge for the adult congenital heart disease community. We have a registry through the American College of Cardiology, and I know I was in instrumental to even start it with many other people, Dr. Martin and so many others, many years ago. And it, it relates to interventions in adult congenital heart disease or even pediatric population. I think it's time with your growing population of adult congenital heart disease to have at least a registry from which you can enroll patients to understand. Not a single center alone will ever be able to do that. So either a national, international collaborative in adult congenital heart disease patients where nowadays you have, what do you have? You have multiple medical therapies that you shared with us. We don't know where their role is. We have catheter-based procedures. We still don't know exactly where. We have electrophysiological procedures that are very important. Uh, we have advanced treatments for transplantation and everything else, which obviously is very specialized, has to be done in a very specialized area. So my challenge to all of you and to the audience in general is really this is time
to do something for the adult congenital heart disease population where you can get more data and hopefully help you and help them navigate you know, this difficult situation. So thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with, uh, with us. I think we have not really dealt with this topic of advanced heart failure, adult congenital heart disease, and I think it's a very important one uh, from, an, uh, from an acknowledgement point of view, from a research point of view, and I think from a patient care point of view. Thank you very much. Thank you.